So tonight, um, I'm going to do something different. I'm not going to just give you a report on what's going on. I'm going to go deep. And um, we're going to have to start doing this for our people so that they master certain concepts which are very problematic because they go against the um, current uh, way of thinking of the institutions, of the scientific community, and all of the uh, so-called experts. They don't agree with what we're going to say, what I'm going to say tonight. Okay, so uh, tonight we are going to look at the current world situation from the standpoint of Lynn's paper from 2009, uh, February of 2009, entitled, Now Comes Economic Time. And LaRouche's concept of time is based on the revolutionary work of a series of scientists, starting with Johannes Kepler, but especially Leibniz, and most of all, um, Riemann, uh, and later Einstein. Now, real time is not clock time. Real time in the universe is measured in the anti-entropic shift in the development of the physical universe. Right there, I'm now an extreme heretic. I am saying that the universe is developing against the running down process. That's, you cannot say that in a physics class. You cannot say that in any physics department in the United States, at least. I would say the world. In most of the world. Real time is measured in the changes in the nature of the system in the anti-running down, anti-entropy of, of the introduction of something which changes the physical nature of the universe, which also changes all the physical relationships, as well as all the events which are measured in terms of time. So the time is as a measure of events, not as a measure of, of uh, a clock. It, it's changing. It's a, change, it's a changing rate. I'll give you a, 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 a typical an example. Um, you have electoral time in the United States. It's every two years. There's a congressional election. Every four years, a presidential election. Every, every six years, a senat senatorial election. People run the political system based on that time. But then there's a different time which is overwhelming that time, which is the physical time of the physical, economic, political time. The strategic time is totally different. And so people who are thinking in terms of electoral time, in terms of getting things done or doing things, are, are, are completely now lost in the reality of the world, which is overcoming the electoral time. That's just an example. There are thousands of examples. Okay. Now, in other words, in other words, what I'm saying is that the universe is finite at any point, but to maintain itself from running down, new unfolding principles yet to be introduced must be introduced, which upshifts the universe towards greater complexity, greater organization, and transformative and a quicker tempo of activity and interconnection. These new principles are only potential or implicit in the present, yet in eternity they are a successive infinity, uh, they're, they're successively, uh, there's an infinite succession of such principles, which are it only exist in potential, and with each new principle, the, 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 relation, the spatial relationships in the universe change, as does the time, the, the rate of time changes. And this is what Einstein meant by saying that the universe is bounded, but infinite. In other words, there's no end to the development of the universe, but at any one point, it is bounded. It's not, it's not infinite. But there's no end to the, the development of the universe. Since human beings make discoveries in the very nature 
and uh, in, in, in how and how the universe is organized, not previously known to humans. The application of those discoveries by humans represents a new principle of action being introduced into the universe. The, the ability of a human being to take a discovery, like discovery of nuclear, the, the nucleus and, and breaking up the nucleus and um, you know, starting with uh, plutonium, starting with uh, um, uh, radium, uh, represents a new principle of action being introduced into the universe. So that there's a change in the nature of the universe because something new is coming in that to reorganize the universe. Uh, you know, like, like I gave the example of the discovery of atomic forces, or in a much earlier period, the discovery of fire, fire the ability to make fire, which, is, which are chemical processes. This results in an economic transformation and increase of, of population, <coughs> potential population of humanity. But that only increases the future potential for greater discoveries and greater development. Everything I've just said will get you burned at the stake of ridicule in any physics department, and most likely in most places in the world. Time in the physical universe is not based on clock time, but on the rate of development in an anti-entropic world way. The same is true with space. The nature of space changes as the universe changes. Riemann and Einstein showed that you cannot divorce time and space from the physical universe. The false imaginary view that still plagues our scientists, our politicians, our planners, uh, our establishment, uh, is whether they're economists or historians, is that physical events take place in a in a imaginary construct of three dimensions where, where particles or, 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 or um, objects uh, somehow interact with each other and they interact on, on, a, on a clock time basis and, 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 and um, that's their imaginary view of, of how the world works. So, they don't look at, for instance, they will say, well, Wall Street will always be there. You know, people are poor because they're lazy. Um, you know, the value of anything is the value that it's in the market. It, 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 it's the market value, right? Because they're looking at it in that way. Now, the empire and the oligarchy are operating on clock time. That is, the oligarchical policies culturally, along with their aversion to creativity and, and economic development, are increasing the rate of entropy and the running down of the system that they're governing. They accept that as a reality. That is, the increasing running down of their system and it's factored into their worldview that the, that that's the nature of the universe. That entropy is the is the law of the universe. That the, that everything will eventually run down. And it's also a product of, of their imaginary view of, of, of the universe that is located in the in the difference between Galileo and Kepler. Galileo. Kepler discovered the law of gravity, but Galileo uh, rolled the ball down and said that, that that's gravity, right? And that, the, and that the interaction of the balls, you know, is, it, is, the, is where the law comes from. That's not where, what Kepler, Kepler's concept of gravity is very different. Kepler's concept of gravity is, is a harmonic relationship a spatial relationship in the solar system governed by uh, principles of, of harmonic principles, musical principles, and, and, uh, and, and he discovered it. I won't get into that. Now, the lack of introducing new knowledge and the lack of introducing scientific and technological principles 
or applying what scientific principles and technological principles already exist is causing through an attrition because every, all the universe is running down if you don't do something to if something doesn't happen to bring it to go up to an, another level. The same with the human economy. It, it's either it's going to run down unless you can come up with something that's going to take it to another level. And and that's what's been going on for 50 years, particularly in the United States and Canada, and, and to, to, uh, perhaps a little less in Europe. Now that process of, of running down means that, means that you have to loot your neighbor, or you have to have wars, or you have to prevent raw materials from being used because they're scarce, or, or whatever. But the whole mindset is a, is a negative running down, the world's running down, you know, if you want to stay on top, you got to, you, you know, you got to um, um, make sure that the other person, that the other countries don't develop. Because they're going to use up the resources that, that are finite. The resources are finite. The resources are finite. How many times have you heard that? Resources are finite. Right? Now, the empiricist scientific community and monetarist economic community reject the idea of a continuing upshift in the physical economy or a continuous upshift on a much bigger scale of the universe, which they believe inevitably is running down. And an upshift both in an, is, is also a necessary upshift because they, because they refuse to reject the imaginary construct of time and space that they, that they are, are here to. And when you tell them something different, that there's a relationship, there's a universal relationship between the, 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 the whole and the part, and that as the, as, and it, as the whole and the part, they change together. This doesn't, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. So what does this have to do with the current strategic situation? Well, this is what it has to do with the current strategic situation. And if you get a sense of this, you'll, it'll, be, it'll be profound. After many trials and tribulations, China is rejecting, in their economic practice, the views of Newton and Descartes, the views of clock time and, 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 and um, three-dimensional empty space. Um, and have shifted, and this is the significance, they have shifted to an all-out, no-limits development in perpetuity. That is, you go to one breakthrough, you don't stop there. You go to the next breakthrough. You go to the next breakthrough. They have either a combination of Lyndon LaRouche's works and the study of Lyndon LaRouche's works and, and the revival of Confucianism, they appear to have this idea that that's what humanity is, is supposed to do, that that's, the, that's what human beings are. They're supposed to go, they're not supposed to stop, they're supposed to keep going. And this anti-entropic continuous process of scientific discoveries and their application. It's not Kennedy getting up and, and saying we're going to get to the moon and, and put a man on the moon by 1970. No, it's that's only the first step. Then the next one is the first step. Then the next one is the first step. It's it's it's, it's not ending. It's not ending. That's the whole point. It involves a cultural transformation. It involves the idea that poverty will be eradicated in the entire planet by 2050. A continuous anti-entropic process globally. <clears throat> what this means is rapid change. Uh, rapid change in the economy, rapid change in the skills, rapid change in outlook, in education, and the dissemination of knowledge. And the Belt and Road is merely a physical platform for the increase in economic time. And once it's fully established, and once it does its job of development, then we go to the next platform, which is probably the, the inter, inter, um, inter solar system belt and road. And then we go to the next platform. 
I'm not saying it is, but I'm just saying that that's the mentality. That's the mentality that you're dealing with. However, a different system exists in, in Europe and in North America. It is called clock time. It's a conservation of resources, like I was saying. Uh, it's budget cutting. It's an increasing traffic jam every year. The next day is a bigger traffic jam, more congested. The infrastructure is collapsing. It's old. It's, not, it, it, it's been getting old for a long time. This is even starting to affect the U.S. military in quantitative terms. I mean, qualitative terms, as China and Russia, as you saw, are in the process of going to a much more advanced electrical. Um, advanced principles in, in, in defensive weaponry, that is the weaponry that can, um, you saw with the drones, that, that, um, there, was a, there was an attack on uh, uh, an air base in Syria by drones, and the, the Russians are, are moving as rapidly as they can in, in the electrical, in the actual radar electrical electronics, electronics yeah. Now how, how does this govern the strategic situation? Okay. Wall Street, the city of London, this very system that's driving the world down into a, uh, increasing lack of development and attrition and collapse. This very financial system, this very system of empire. And all empires die because they are on clock time. They are not on economic time. If they were on economic time, they wouldn't be an empire and they wouldn't die. Okay? They exist to prevent development and to plunder the world. They exist to control trade, not for development, but for, for controlling it for financial gain. And they call it free trade, but it's actually slave trade. It is now in a crisis. The three major hotspots that you're hearing about, Ukraine, North Korea, and Middle East, etc., are the basis of this system. Under no circumstances can these hotspots be resolved without bringing down the whole system, especially now. <coughs> this is the contradiction of the initial perusal I had of the U.S. National Security Strategy Report, which starts off with the defense of the nation, uh, the borders, and defense against non-state actors, meaning terrorism, and the drug trade. And yet, the purpose of the document in the introduction says that the purpose is to uh, maintain American hegemony against those, those undemocratic elements that would want to move the world away from the free trade system. So it's a total contradiction because the very actors that they're talking about, the terrorists, and the very uh, destructive efforts of the drug trade are part of what's holding the whole system up. So it's a very contradictory, uh, but it's, it's full of contradictions. And, and you have to ask yourself, what do these people recognize that everything they're saying in this strategic strategy report is a complete contradiction? And it's, 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 it's not truthful. Do they know that, that's what, that what they're saying is not truthful? And I wonder. I hope they do because it has to change. So, so Trump was elected by a, a process that was going on in, internationally of a rejection of this system. And in the U.S., those constituents were primarily those who were dissatisfied and were marginalized. However, these constituents don't yet have a policy that will move the U.S. in an anti-entropic reversal of 50 years of decay, 50 years of decline from the, from the late 60s. Uh, so this is what we're addressing in part with this pamphlet that is now being circulated uh, and to, to the Trump layers, to the Congress, to the state legislators, and also in our field appointments. Uh, this, is, this, is the, this is 
bringing people to an awareness of not just what China is doing, what the what the Belt and Road is, but what what are the laws, what are the solutions for laws, but developing a, a comprehensive idea of how you reverse this process that has been going on in a, in a very uh, effective way that's been going on for 50 years. Um, So this is the reality of economic time. One reality, which is the Chinese, what the Chinese are doing, is speeding up clock time. The other reality is uh, is actually reversing. You're moving, you're reversing in the physical economic sense. You're reversing, and so you're going backward in time. You're going backward to an earlier uh, time, you know, where things don't work like they did. So you're actually reversing. You're actually reversing in, in, in the sense of physical time. And without China's Belt and Road coming on as it has and what it is now starting to do, the world would be regressing to a much lower economic level. And with all of the consequences of mass death and mass, um, ultimately mass death and wars and everything else, with or without nuclear war. And if the, if the trends that we are we have been experiencing within the Atlantic imperial system, within the uh, within that system, uh, had, had continued, we would we we would be faced with that. Now, 2018 is the year it comes to a head, economic time versus clock time. Uh, now, I, I want to mention that there is a uh, downing realization that we're picking up inside the U.S. institutions that Wall Street cannot deliver on, on infrastructure, that the private sector of Wall Street cannot deliver. And Trump made a big issue of infrastructure in his campaign. <clears throat> He's going to have to present something to the population of the United States on the 30th of January. And, any, and, and, and there's no means under the existing system for them to carry it out. So the, so the, so the deficit of, of that reality is, is coming home. And we have experienced it in, in the quality of or the, or the the quality of the conversations we are having in our in our distribution to the U.S. Senate and to the uh, U.S. Congress, and that people are sitting down and asking us how what's the difference between the Federal Reserve and the National Bank? How does this work? How does that work? How do you do it? Because there is this sense that you can't do anything under the existing system, and uh, at the same time, we are we have a group of organizers experienced organizers reaching out by phone and email to uh, everyone that we, we, we can locate who was active in the Trump campaign or active as a network uh, of, of supporting Trump versus uh, there would be a whole grouping of state legislators who would be a whole grouping of people and in, 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 in different people. One case is a guy who's very old, he's a retired community banker who was res responsible for putting the Glass-Steagall resolution on the Republican Party platform. And he's, a, he's very, we found out after talking to him that he's very pro rouge and that he, you know, that he's determined to get, black, to get Trump to go with Glass-Steagall. So that we, we are intersecting these kind of layers with our, uh, with our pamphlet, which, which is very important. It's a very important thing that we're doing. And uh, now, so, so Trump's State of the Union message is going to have to say something real. And so there is a crisis building inside the Trump team and inside many of the people that we're talking because they don't have they don't have uh, they don't have a way to implement uh, the infrastructure and the, and the mentality of people like McConnell, Mitch McConnell and Ryan is insane. You know, that somehow they're going to um, have a private public partnership. You know, we're going to have infrastructure, right? All it is is a ripoff. You know, and that's the only way. To, uh, when, when you talk infrastructure to these to these kind of people, 
They're just saying, well, you know, let's, let's get the gravy. You know, we're not going to be able to do anything because it's a hopeless situation. Let's get, let's get the gravy. We're not going to change the nature of the economy because th this project or that project isn't going to change. You have to do the whole thing. You have to do a whole concept of upgrading everything. This is what, the, this is what our pamphlet is trying to get across. Okay? So, so, so all the crap going on with and around Trump is a reflection of this crisis. Uh, does the U.S. nuke Russia and China before running down, that their running down system is overwhelmed by the technology and the economic, economics and culture that's now coming out of this whole process? That's the issue. That's really what it's about. So all this pressure, hysteria, is related to that. Both Russia and China have put their population in increasing readiness for a nuclear war. Their leadership believes uh, is quite possible, if not likely. So that's that's the big hump in the road. Yet last week we had an immense breakthrough in Europe towards a profound shift on a global scale. On January 8th, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, went to China. Now. You can bless Charles de Gaulle for this. He got tired of parliamentary crap. And he forced through what became known as the Fifth Republic, which is a presidential system. Yeah, they have a parliament. They have a government. But the president, they have a president. Right? And so, so this young character uh, went to China. And he did something that um, shocked us. Okay, it shocked us. And uh, this is part of what he did. Something that was totally shocking. And I'll, went, I'll read you. Rather than just going to describe it, I'll read you from the speeches. I'll read you from the speech that he um, that he did in in. Uh, uh, He did something very shocking. Um, okay. So this, uh, this is from a number of speeches he gave in China. One, one was in the co press conference the second day with, um, uh, I guess with Xi Jinping. The, the first one was at the uh, Xi'an, the, 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 the city that, where the, where the with the silk, the old silk road got started. He said, It is in the same spirit that I wish for us to advance on the new silk road. Indeed, one bound, one road is the perspective gave itself and that it has proposed to the world. When a proposal is on the table, it is not my habit not to discuss it. I understand the opportunities for China on the economic level for finding new markets internationally on the uh, political level in order to open up regions hit by underdevelopment, on the diplomatic level to stabilize trade in fertile and fragile regions where there are states in difficulty, and in developing regions on a cultural level since it is a matter of exerting leadership with the force of new ideas. I think that the initiative of the New Silk Road can meet our in interests, those of France and of Europe, if we give ourselves the means to really work together. After all, the Silk Road were never purely Chinese, if I'm honest. When we walk, talk about the maritime Silk Roads uh, and so forth. And the genius of the first Silk Road was to have often reinvented European roads and made them Chinese roads. I'm saying that in a substantial way, these roads are still shared. And if they are roads, they cannot be one way. I am thus ready to work to the announced objectives, road, railroad, airport, maritime, and technological infrastructure programs along the Silk Road can provide a response to the infrastructure deficit, particularly in Asia. 
The pooling of our financial resources, public and private, for cross-border projects can strengthen the connectivity between Europe and Asia and beyond. In the Middle East and Africa, and allow better integration structure and opening up to the, the growth of trade. At the same time, it will be, do much more. And the city of Xi'an is a living example. Finally, it is a matter of giving ourselves a perspective at a moment when the shared grand narratives are so sorely lacking in the world. Grand shared narratives. I must say, it is one of the great merits of the, of the Silk Road proposed by Xi Jinping. These Silk Roads reactivate the imagination of a new civilization of fruitful exchanges and shared wealth. And they show to all those who thought we were in a tired postmodern world where the great stories were forbidden, that those who decide to live great epics can make others dream as well. I believe profoundly in great stories. It is up to France and it is up to Europe to contribute its share of imagination to this proposal and to work at it in the months and years to come. This will be the object of my exchanges with uh, President Xi Jinping, to define the agenda of trust that I want we put together. I know that some will say that this agenda of trust must be one to create an equilibrium between developing in this country and a developed one. But China is no longer a developing country. It is a country which is bypassing that largely. Therefore, we must reinvest here in terms of a new relationship. And the Silk Road are the very expression of that new relationship of China to the world. I propose to identify very concretely the political framework in which we can build that partnership, that cooperation, and that common strategy. I am convinced profoundly that if Europe and China know how to establish that goal together. This initiative could be the occasion of relaunching very pra pragmatically the multilateralism which is today lacking in concrete realizations. So on and on. So he keeps going. Now, uh, concretely, uh, there's two concrete areas that are very crucial. One is that France has a advanced nuclear recycling capability. And they're now moving to share their technology with China and have China work on that technology in collaboration with France. This is, this is the first one. This is huge. The second one is he is calling for the French to work completely with the Chinese in Africa. To, and he has attacked the uh, view of, of, of neocolonialism and neoliberalism and the wars that have been going on uh, and the, the, the previous French policies of colonial, which he believed made, made, made matters worse. But, to, but he's committed to working with China on developing Africa. Now, this is big. This is France. Britain is ungovernable right now. Germany is not governable either. And this is France stepping forward and saying, OK, we're going to leave Europe. We're going to leave the other half of this thing. And it is important to note that he spoke with Trump before he went, and he spoke with Trump afterwards. He had an extensive discussion with Trump on all of this, including North Korea. So, um, so that that's that is a huge development. And uh, so now, now what's the significance of Africa in all of this? this is, I, I want to put this on the table here. Africa has been a very marginalized part of the world. Its only value has been resources. Otherwise, it's been kept backward. Um, the African nations are, are not based on languages and are not based on, the, the boundaries are not based on, on, uh, on uh, you know, on any kind of ethnic unity. So a lot of the boundaries are with different ethnic groups that have different um, relation, that have a different self idea, and and that's their normal. Uh, those ethnic things are the normal um, um, point of reference, and so um, the only way you're going to unify those uh, people and get them to accept one another is if you develop the area. 
But what do you do when you develop the area? Let me tell you, Africa, with well, well, many, many over a billion people, has this enormous landmass. And this is arable landmass. This is uh, with the, um, the project that the, that the Chinese are now starting to commit themselves to, which is the, the Transaco project of moving water from the water-laden areas in the Congo Basin north into the Sahara, coupled with the railway and industrial parks and, and, and potential agriculture in the region is massive. One of the countries that's now teaming up with Africa very closely now is Zimbabwe. The new president of Zimbabwe is on his way to China. There, China is going to go big in Zimbabwe. They're going big in other areas. And um, this is the vision for Africa. And in fact, the French are saying they're going to work with that. It's very significant because if it's true, that means they're not going to play the usual colonial games anymore than the usual neo-colonial games anyway. So, now what is the physical issue of Africa? When you develop Africa, you are causing a planetary shift away from, uh, away from uh, running down, away from, to, to, a, to a massive upshift. Because you're bringing in well over a billion people into a expanded productive activity, you know, on the, on the level of China it, uh, by itself. You know, not, it's about the same equivalent people. There's a probably, well, maybe, maybe a little bit less or almost as many people in Africa as there are in China or, or in India. So you're bringing these parts of the world and their human potential into, into, into development. And then the connectivity is very important. So you're actually shifting the whole planet out of a running down mode into an actual sustainable. When they talk, if you want to know, know what the true word of sustainable means, it means anti-entropic expansion and development. That's sustainable. That's the only thing that is sustainable in, in, the, human, in the human sense. So, <coughs> what options are there? In clock time, there are no options. There are only, the only options are in economic time. In clock time, Wall Street, you know, and so, so that's what we're, we're looking at. That's what we're looking at. And um, it is interesting, latest development, and just an aside, the latest development is very interesting. Chinese economists have come to New York to talk to um, U.S. economists. I, I forgot the, the direct reference. But what they're saying to, the, to these economists is, look, the, the gross domestic product is not a, the measurement we want for, for, for a nation's wealth, for, for how rich a nation is or how productive it is. Because it, it has values that relate to monetary values, it has values that relate to, to stock, stock market values, it has values that have no relationship to the physical economy. What they're saying is a new, a new uh, standard of uh, measurement needs to be adopted for an economy, and it's based upon the standard of living of, of people. That is, you measure how advanced an economy is, not in terms of GDP, but in terms of the basket of currents, basket of the market basket of goods available per household in the country as a whole, per household on an average in the country as a whole. That's Lyndon LaRouche, by the way. That's how LaRouche is measured, measures economic wealth in a society. You measure it by the 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 well, he measures it a little bit more, but the, the actual economic wealth at any one particular moment is measured in the aggregate uh, standard of living of the population and the market basket of goods that are available to them. That's how you measure economic growth. And if that increases, then you're, you're increasing a, a GDP. An increase in nominal GDP does not indicate an increase in the real physical. Uh, so this is what the Chinese are proposing. That the West changes metric in terms of wealth, and they're they're introducing this in China. So where where they're not going to use GDP anymore, they're going to use this idea of of, of uh, the rise. Um, so so I'm going to conclude, and uh, we have a we have a another video of of LaRouche from uh, 2013, I think it is. 
Oh, when was that? 2013? I, I forgot when it was. It was on the website. How many people saw that? I sent it out to people. Oh, yeah. yeah. On the webcast, you mean? Yeah. yeah. No. I don't know. If, I don't That's know going, no, 2003. 2003. Yeah. Um, would people be willing to talk about yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's see it. Yeah. Okay, okay, so let's yeah, go. So I have one last thing to say. Would you? The rise and fall of empires is clock time. The transformation of humanity in the Industrial Revolution is economic time. So that's that's what here, I'm here. Hey. Can you get the lights, Paul? Yeah. When you when you go back. Okay. Just wait, Paul. Hold on. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. But okay. This will be a people when you mention the word economics is money. They try to explain a system of money which is a sound system, they argue, for running an economy. And as I said, a system of money is insane intrinsically because it's only paper, it's arbitrary, it has no physical content. Did you ever see money plow a field? Did you ever see a coin talking? If you did, you know you should talk to, to about that. <laughs> All right, so therefore, the money has no intrinsic value. Nor does gold have an intrinsic value as a currency. These things have determined values by the processes in which they function. Money is merely a medium of exchange. It is necessary because society is composed of tightly integrated and complex social relations. And therefore, in order to process the exchange of goods and other things, you need money as a measure of the political, social political process of exchange. The root of an economy is man. There is no economy among animals. An economy reflects a characteristic of people. The human individual, the difference between the individual and the beast. That is these cognitive powers by which we discover universal physical principles, derive new technologies or apply technology based on these principles. We apply them to our problems. And therefore we find that through our efforts, our physical efforts, or the expenditure of our time, that we are able to produce more wealth than it costs to keep us in the process of production both in terms of our labor, in terms of the cost to maintain the families in which we come, but also in the cost to society of capital expenditures on which we rely, both in private industry and by government, including large-scale infrastructure, things of that sort. We rely upon this. Our productivity depends upon it. And therefore, it is the power of man to make dis discoveries and to use them. Discoveries derived from discovery of universal physical principles which increases the value of what is produced over the cost of production. And therefore, essentially, economy starts with purely physical values in the sense of, of uh, the physical values dependent upon man's ability to discover universal physical principles and to derive and apply technologies obtained through these discoveries. That is real economics. And that's where how wealth is produced, essentially, by the, from the standpoint of the individual. When we're talking about the individual entrepreneur who runs a small firm, his primary function is as a mediation of these kinds of discoveries or the technologies derived from them. He's become a master of applying these technologies to <coughs> something for some purpose. He's able to use his judgment in such a way that these things are successful in actually producing more wealth for society and that effect than the cost of that production. That's a simple physical relationship, like the relationship of the individual mind to the discovery of a universal physical principle. Then you have the second aspect. Now let's suppose that you have a very intelligent fellow. He's plunked down somewhere on the planet. He's given a machine to himself what all the materials needed to produce. Is that going to determine his productivity? 
No. What's going to determine his productivity is the educational system in which that population lives, the level of infrastructure, such as the production and distribution of power, the degree to which the environment is controlled by large-scale water management, by forestation, all these other things, which are the conditions of life, the conditions of social life, determine how productive the individual entrepreneur, the individual worker will be in society. So look, it is not from the individual labor as such that the wealth comes. The ability of man to produce more than the cost of production depends not only on the individual, it depends upon the conditions of life in society in which that individual operates. Therefore, we have the division in economy, which is modern national economy. The division between the activity of the individual as individual, using technologies, <coughs> developing, perfecting the application of technologies derived from universal physical principles, from the mind of the individual. The individual mind's relationship to nature is the primary thing there. But that does not determine the productivity of labor. What determines the productivity of labor variably is the conditions of society in which this is done. So therefore you have in economy two things to consider. You have the local activity and you also have then the organization of the society as a whole. The national infrastructure, water management, educational systems, healthcare systems, all of these things which are the responsibility primarily of government. So these are the problems of economy. First of all, economy is physical, it is not monetary. To believe in a monetary basis for an economy is the first step toward disaster. What we do with the government is we regulate the economy in such a way that the, the value, money value, of products does not rise above the uh, product themselves as a percent of income. That was the percent of income required to brought, buy a product uh, must not rise uh, above the money uh, income uh, price of the standard living. The government must do that. How? By regulating interest rates, by regulating the way in which money is put into circulation, by taxation. You tax things that are higher, which are of less value to society. You put a high tax on financial capital gains, which are not invested in a useful way. Exactly the opposite of Camp Roth, the direct opposite of today's policy. You tax things less if they are investments in productive values. You may tax them not at all if you think they're sufficiently important to people. In other words, if the people invest in producing something, which is so essential to society, we want it, we may tax it almost at nothing, no tax at all. Whereas things which are undesirable should be taxed. Things which are parasitical should be taxed. If there's a tendency toward inflation, tax it out of existence by taxing the people who are inflating values. Protect the prices of things which are valuable. Force the protection of the prices of production of things that are needed. If you want more farmers, make sure the farmers get a fair price. If you want better farm goods, make sure the farmers get a fair price. If you want investment in a certain industry, make sure a fair price is available in that industry. Investment tax credits, the Kennedy investment tax credits, just an example of that. So what we do in the same society is we regulate the flow of money, the issue and flow of money. We regulate interest rates. We regulate trade tariffs. <coughs> we enter into agreements with other countries on trade in order to protect investments, essential investments of those countries, including our own. So therefore, we regulate the flows of money in such a way that the price of goods, price of money, does not rise above the price of goods. As a matter of fact, we do it in such a way that through productivity, the price of goods will drop in terms of money terms. 
relative to the quality of goods produced. We also demand that the a tax program, which supports the kind of infrastructural investments we require for public infrastructure, such as power generation and distribution, we will provide, in a sense, what some people call subsidies. We will give favorable <coughs> treatment in terms of loans, favorable treatment in terms of taxation rates to those. And since we wish to fund the public investment area, that is where the public invests, as we used to, you know, people used to invest their savings, ordinary families would invest their savings for their retirement in public utilities. Public utilities used to be under Roosevelt and beyond were regulated. They, they didn't yield a high interest rate, but they were, they were dependent. People could look forward to retirement or to an emergency knowing that their investment in a bond or a public utility would retain its value, would not be subject to, to, to fluctuations on the, on the financial market. We regulate, in fact. So the key thing here is government must regulate. The government must regulate is not, not a matter of statism versus uh, free enterprise. That's nonsense. 50% of a modern economy, at least, is in public infrastructure. It costs at least, I mean, 50% of the total investment, the total cost of operating an economy is located in basic economic infrastructure. Power, transportation, water management, education, health care, so forth and so on. Sit urban management. And therefore, the state must provide that either in the form of direct investment by at various levels of government, or it must provide that providing a structure in which private investment is encouraged in public infrastructure and that area is regulated to make sure it works. And then on, on top of that, we give incentives, financial incentives in terms of tax, in terms of credit, and so forth, to entrepreneurship, to families who are trying to buy houses or acquire houses and so forth. That is the way the US economy would function when it was following its constitutional intent. And the problem today is we've gone in a different direction. So that would be awesome.